Thank you all for coming out and being a part of what God's doing here. I want to give a welcome to all the people who are tuning in online. Thank you for being a part of this community. And I'm excited because today is the second in the series we're doing called Your Next Step. And this isn't just a series, guys. This is the heartbeat of why Vertical Church exists, where we're going, and really our desire for each and every one of you. Our commitment, because what we want to see in each and every one of your lives is you to fulfill the plan and purpose that God intended for your life. We're committed to building steps, opportunities for you to grow and reach all the potential that God has for you. We want to see everyone live out the purpose that God has for them individually and grow and be everything. So determine this year, 2018, to be a year of true spiritual growth, to know your Father in heaven more intimately than you've ever known, and to see your life transformed and reflect the life of Jesus in your family, in your neighborhoods, in your workplace, and wherever where you go, that the light of Christ might be seen through your life. Amen? And so we've been talking about discipleship because discipleship is how we grow up in Christ. And there are three essentials to growing up in our walk with Christ. Three essentials that they are number one, is that we need to have right spiritual beliefs. Right spiritual beliefs. In other words, there are certain things that are fundamental for us to believe. If we are in truth believers, we need to have the right spiritual beliefs. Secondly, we need to have right spiritual practices. Because it's not just what you believe, it's what you do. And so we have to have right spiritual practices. And thirdly, we need to, for, to growth, we need to selfless spiritual activities. So it's a progression. And so the church's commitment is to help you grow in your walk with Christ. Because that's the mission of the church. When Jesus gave what we call the Great Commission, he said, go and make disciples. So discipleship is not something the church does. It's what the church does. And discipleship is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Being a disciple is a follower. It means there's a progressive journey. Because the ultimate aim, the goal that we're all striving for, hopefully, is to become like Christ. That's what it means to be a follower. And so we're committed to building steps, creating steps, because why? Steps lead somewhere. And so in essence, our vision, our, our purpose, when you talk about discipleship, the term discipleship, when you add ship to disciple, it literally means the state of. And it infers the idea that it's a journey. It's becoming. And so in essence, we want to see you all become. And that's why at Vertical Church, our mission is leading people to take their next step with Christ. To meeting people to take their next step with God. Why? Because life is about steps. It's taking the next one. It's not worrying about all the ones that are ahead. It's just dealing with the next one that comes your way. Because it's a progressive journey. And that's why we say our vision is reaching people that don't follow Jesus and maturing the people who do. Because everyone is invited. The simplest of Jesus' invitations is just as true today as it always was. Follow me. And so whether you have just beginning the journey or whether you've been on it, it's that state of progressing. It's that state of not, become, not becoming content where you've been, but continuing to look forward to where you're going. To becoming everything that God intended and created for you to do. And so that's why our approach, you're going to hear us talk a lot about it. I'm starting this series this year because it is our approach. Next steps is what I call a discipleship philosophy because there's always another step. If the journey is to become like Jesus, there's always another challenge. There's always another step. And so our job, our mission, our desire is to help you and to lead you to take your next step. With God. Hopefully we all begin to ask that question. Hopefully we all begin to look, no matter where you are in the journey, no matter where your progression and where your spiritual state is, is that we would continue to move forward and to be everything that God intended for us to be. And so it is that end. And so today we're going to talk and center on the idea of our method. How do we go about that? How do we go about it? If you're taking notes with me today, this is critical to see. And that's this. Discipleship is a community thing. Now, that may be new to some folks because often what we try to do is make it just about us and God. But discipleship is not something you do alone. Jesus didn't do it alone. He had a team of people that he walked with. 
He called them into this relationship of being disciples. So it's not something you pursue alone. Discipleship is a community thing. God desires for you and I to be connected in community. In fact, Jesus said the way that other people would know we are his disciples. I mean, think about that for a moment. How should people know you're a disciple? Because you don't smoke, curse, or chew, or hang around with people who do? I mean, is that what it? No, Jesus gave us the trademark. He told us what it should be that we should look to to know that we are in truth the disciples. If you have a Bible today, I encourage you to be a Bible reader. In fact, it's impossible, my friends, to truly grow and mature and to be like Christ apart from God's Word because Jesus was the living Word. The way you know Him is not subjectively, it's not your thoughts or your imaginations, but it's what has been revealed. And so, the New Testament begins with what we call Gospels. They're stories of the life of Jesus written by eyewitnesses, okay? And the fourth one in it is John. So turn in John's Gospel, John chapter 13. This is what we eloquently refer to as the night of the Last Supper. Really what Jesus was doing that evening was having a Passover meal with his disciples. And John, who wrote this, was probably the closest person relationally as a human being to the living Christ. John was a follower of Jesus, and he was there that night, and this is what he records. Jesus turns to his own disciples that evening and says, a new command. Notice he didn't say a new suggestion, a new idea, I want to float your way. He said, no, it's a command. Because again, we talked about this last week. The beginning of the journey of following Jesus is who is he to you personally? Is he God in a body? Is he truly the, the one that came to save us from our sins? Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another. Now, he didn't stop there. Because if he just said love one another, that could be very subjective. Because we all think we love, okay? Well, I love. Of course I love people. But Jesus said love one another. But then he goes on to qualify what he meant. And the type of love that would be a uh, uh, determinant of what he was talking about. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Uh, as, in other words, he was the model. Again, discipleship, disciple is a, is a follower. It's someone who aspires to be like. Jesus said, I want you to learn to love as I love. Not as you think, not as you qualify, but love one another as I have loved you. And why is that significant? Why is that important? Look at verse 35. He said this, by this, by what? By loving one another as he loved us. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. You see, that's the difference of being a disciple. Jesus called us to build disciples. He didn't, go, he didn't say, go make Christians of all nations. He said, go make disciples. Why? Because the word disciple and what it means to be a disciple is so clearly defined in Scripture. A Christian, we talked about this last week, a Christian can be anything that people think they want. I mean, we qualify a whole host of stuff and call it Christian, okay? But being a disciple, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If, and here's the point, if means it's conditional. We always have a choice. If you love one another. Question. Would you call that our brand? If you were to think the term Christian in your mind right now, what's the first thing that would come to mind? Would it be a community of love? If you were to ask people on the street, what do they think of when they think of the term Christian? What comes to their mind first and foremost? Is it a loving community? People who love like Jesus loves? You just better be prepared if you ask that question. Because here, anybody know who Anne Rice is? Anybody know who that is? Anne Rice was a famous author. You know, her, her stuff sold in the millions and millions. Best-selling author for years and years. Anne Rice wrote things like the Vampire Diaries and stuff like that. So maybe you're not familiar with her writings, but she was very, very popular. She was raised Roman Catholic, so she was originally in her early years a believer, but then she walked away from faith. 
And for four decades, she was an atheist, okay? But then she returned to faith in Christ in her 50s. I think it was in her late 50s. But after being around the Christian community for a period of time, she posted something on her Facebook page that created a lot of controversy. And here's the quote that she, she posted. She said, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ. What's amazing to me is when you talk to people on the street, people who don't follow Jesus, people generally have a good opinion of Jesus, just not his followers. Okay? In fact, a lot of people said it'd be easy to follow Jesus if it wasn't for all the people who call themselves after his name. Okay? Today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ always, but not being a Christian or being a part of Christianity. It is simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious. Don't you love people who write well? When's the last time you used that word? Yes, disputatious. Disputatious and deservedly infamous group. Unfortunately, if we're honest, far too often Christianity has been more associated with quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, yes, people that are deservedly infamous. And so in other words, generally speaking, our brand, what we're known of, is not what Jesus said we would be known by. So in essence, if you're following me today, if you're taking notes, watch. A disciple is one who learns, and I wrote this pur purposely. A disciple is one who learns to love like Jesus. Because you know what comes natural to you and I? Being selfish. Now, I, I mean, I know I don't want to shock you, but listen. Do you have to teach a child to be selfish? No, they come out of the womb, right? Everything is mine. As good parents, you try to teach them to what? Share, right? Because we are by nature, think about ourselves first. Okay, because that's human nature. But a disciple is one who learns to love like Jesus. In other words, to love like Jesus means that we're willing to give of ourselves. To love like Jesus means we're willing to lay down our lives to help and to aid others, to be everything they can be. To love like Jesus literally means that we care about our connections with other people and not just about ourselves. A loving community is what Honestly, the world desperately longs to be a part of. They just don't think it's possible. Because if we are truly following the mission of Christ, it's not something you can do alone. You grow in love as you connect with other people. You cannot grow and mature in love alone. In fact, what's fascinating to me, one of the people in my, in my small group, you know, we're in the, our, our all-church small group that's meeting at our house. One of the people said last week, and I thought this was so hilarious, but really true. He said, man, it would be easy to be a great Christian if it wasn't for all these people. <laughs> Think about it. You know, following Jesus and being a part of it and living it out, nobody generally thinks they have a problem loving God. The issue is loving the other people around us, right? But Jesus said these, probably his most famous communication, what we would call the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew's Gospel. He said this, to be like our Father. See, to truly love is what it means to be a child of God. Because Jesus said words that were ostentatious, that were, that were so out of the box. No one had ever said this before. Actually, nobody's ever said it since. Jesus said, love your enemies. You say, what? Are you kidding me? Who does that? He said, your Father in heaven... He sends rain upon the just and the unjust. God sent his one and only son into the world to make a way through his son. For God demonstrated his love for us. That when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were hostile to God, God didn't respond to us. God made a way for us. And Jesus said to be like your father because he said this. Anyone can love people who are nice to you. 
publicans, sinners. What's the difference? What's their distinguishing about you if you just love other people that are kind or nice to you? It's when you love when it's not easy to love. It's when you love when it's not convenient to love. When you love when it's uncomfortable to love. When you don't want to love. That's what it means to be a disciple of me. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to go to the cross? Do you think it was easy for him to lay down his life for us that didn't even give him the time of day? And here it is. Jesus said, it's loving as I love that should distinguish us. That's our brand. That's what we should be known by. In fact, how are all of us connected as followers of Jesus? Because of who Jesus is, correct? More importantly, what he did. And what did Jesus do for you and I? On that cross, what did he accomplish? He died for our what? For our sins, right? And the fact of the matter is, what unites every one of us together is that all of us have baggage. We're all flawed. We've all fallen short. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. I mean, just admit it. There's a freedom in that end. Pretending like something's not doesn't make it something else, okay? No, we all have flaws. But that was the good news that brought us together. That God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And God didn't provide salvation. He didn't provide forgiveness because we warranted it, because we deserved it. None of us earned what Christ did for us, did we? No, he did it for us by, listen, here's the word, grace. God didn't give us what we deserve. In fact, he gave us the exact opposite of what we deserve. God was gracious to us. Now here's the simple part. If God was gracious to us, can't we cut one another some slack? I always tell people, when you're tempted to get annoyed and upset because of the other people around you, just remember the times when you're annoying and upsetting to the people around you. Whenever somebody's hurt you, offended you, have caused you to have to deal with internal angst, the simple truth is this, if we're honest, I mean, we are in church, we can confess, okay? Just look in the mirror and remember the times when you have created difficulty and pain and hurt others. And remember all of your rationale and reasonings. Well, I didn't mean to do so. I didn't intend to do so. All right, And just remember that that's probably how the person who hurt you is feeling themselves. See, we can actually help one another be better. In fact, it's impossible to grow in love apart from other people. How we mature, how we grow up in Christianity is by the ability that we have to love one another. Because love is the brand. In fact, Jesus made it so simple. He said, there's only one command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you. That's what we should be known for. Maturing and growing as a disciple of Christ means we can't do it apart from community. God connected us together in this mystical union called, listen, the body of Christ. Truth being is this. We were called into community. You can't be a follower of Christ apart from it. We're connected in that. We're interconnected. We need one another, whether you admit it or not. You can't do this alone. You weren't called into it alone. You can't do it apart from community. And that's why our method here at Vertical Church, we want all of us to be involved in community in three separate ways. Three separate ways. is what we call the vertical way. The vertical way, the three things, we only do three things as a church to stay strategically simple. Okay, it's our way to become the community God desires to be because when we gather on a Sunday morning like we are right now, we come into this place to celebrate what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done for us, which causes us to be a community of celebration. In other words, we come together and we worship what God has done on our behalf, what's available to us day in and day out, and we grow in that. But that's not it alone. You see, through our vertical groups, Our groups allow us to become a community of transformation because we don't believe you can change all by yourself. We believe that God does something special, unique, in the midst of community. And thirdly, when our faith takes action, when when it's not just about what we say, but it's about living our lives to make a difference in the lives of other people. When our faith grows and matures enough to recognize 
that it's about what we do in love. See, love has to have expression. Love isn't enough in word, but it must be in what we do. And when we're willing to live life as Jesus lived it, by laying down our lives to serve other people as Christ served us, we become a community of activation. And so listen, follow me here. It's a community, community of celebration. Our weekend celebrations are for everyone. They provide a time for, for the church to gather to worship God corporately and learn his word, right? We all do that. But at the same time, we go out of our way to be a church that unchurched people enjoy, enjoy attending. You know why? Because we never want to forget where we came from. People were instrumental in helping us to come to know what Jesus did for us. We want to remain a community that's not a private club. There's a place for everyone. And so people matter to God. That's why they should matter to us. That's why Jesus came, to provide a way home for every human being to be reunited in a relationship with God. We want those who are far from God to know that they're welcome. And we invite them to explore faith and the opportunity for a relationship with God without pressure or manipulation. In other words, just keep coming. Discover what God's about. Make the decision yourself to believe or not believe. We teach God's word in a relevant and practical and creative way to provide the best opportunity for people to learn no matter where they are at in their faith. That's what our celebrations are all about. That's what Sunday morning's about. But we are also a community of transformation. Why? Because vertical groups are a place to connect relationally and grow spiritually. See, we believe at Vertical Church that life transformation happens in the context of relationships. It's in structured relationships to provide opportunities for growth. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever, have you ever worked out in life? I know exercise can be a dirty word in church. Okay, but listen. Have you ever exercised with somebody else? You know the difference, if you've ever done it, the difference between doing it by yourself and doing it with someone else. Because when you do it with someone else, you tend to go further faster. You, turn, you tend to make less excuses. Because why? We have this tendency. I mean, am I alone here or am I talking the truth in this end? Okay, we have a tendency to let ourselves off all the time. We make excuses and rationales and reasons why we don't need to do that today. I'm tired. But when you know when you're doing it with somebody else, they tend to help you get beyond your reasons and rationales and go further faster. We tend to bring the best out in one another. When we do things together in life, we tend to grow more than we would ever do on our own. And so that's why, next part, we desire to be a church of groups. We believe God lives in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God created us to live in it. In fact, the only place the Bible says in creation Before sin ever entered the picture, there's only one place in creation where God said what he created was not good. Anybody know what that is? He said when he he created man, he said it's not good for a man to be alone. But you know what the tendency is? We have a tendency to isolate, to hide. Because since, since sin entered the picture, we have a way of feeling like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be hurt and we tend to hide. But we see, we believe that God created us to live in community. So getting connected at Vertical Church means participating in a vertical group. Lastly, with community of trans groups, it is in groups that people experience a sense of belonging. See, you may not know, I always tell people all the time, you can only love people to the degree that you know them. That's why Kath and I love, every time we do vertical, whenever we do groups at our home, You get to know people at a more deeper level than you've ever known before, and it makes you appreciate them and love them even greater than you did before. You see, you love people to the degree that you know them, okay? And there's a sense of belonging that develops as life-giving relationships, friendships inspire. People also receive care as they grow in love with one another and become accountable for one another for spiritual growth. See, the more you know about people, the more you can pray for them, the more you can encourage them, the more you can be what Jesus intended us to be, a community that's known by its love for one another. You may not connect with every single person in here. If we are in truth a body, it's kind of like a knee. Your knee connects with your thigh and your shin, correct? But it supports your whole body. You may not connect with everybody, but there is a deeper level of connection that helps us grow and become everything God created us to be. We have to be willing to go there. But lastly, you become a community of activation is this. Our dream team is how we empower volunteers to live out their purpose and serve others 
with their gifts and passions to make a difference in the lives of others. Why? Because all of us were created by God to make a difference in the life of, one, of another person. God is a place. Isn't this good news? Every one of you are significant and important to God. There's things that God created you to do that he didn't create other people to do. He just needs you to step up. He needs you to discover what it is and do it. Because why? Because look at God created a place for each of us where our unique abilities and passions can touch the lives of others. We believe that, your, that our lives will never make sense until we find, develop, and fulfill that purpose. So listen, if you're taking notes with me, it's important. Love should inspire obedience. It all begins with our relationship with God. See, isn't that the beginning? Just like a child when it comes into the world, their relationship is predominantly with their parents. And when we begin to know and understand who God is and what he did for us, our love for God begins. We didn't love God first. God loved us first, correct? And the more we discover who he is, the more we grow in relationship with God. In our hearts, our response is to trust him because obedience is that level of trust. Jesus said these words, if you love me, keep my commands. He only gave us one. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? If you love me. In other words, the more, and this is the important part, this is the progressive growth part of us in our lives. It begins that the more we learn to accept, receive, and be changed by the love of God. Because the love of God sets you free from all the fears and insecurities that you so often tend to keep within. Because God didn't love you for what you did. In fact, the Bible teaches the direct opposite. God wants you to begin to understand love isn't something you earn. Love isn't something you have to try to gain from someone else. God freely and willingly loved you. In other words, if you've ever bought into the lie that says something you have to do, somehow you have to perform before God will love you, that was concocted in hell. Satan has wanted people to believe that, but it's not true at all. While we were yet sinners, God stepped into the world when we did nothing that deserved his love and displayed his love for us by allowing Christ to die for us. And you know what happens? When you begin to believe in and trust in the love of God, it makes you stop having to try to perform. It makes you stop having to try to jump through hoops. It creates a sense of inner security. It creates a sense because you know what? Love is about who you are, not what you do. Love from God, the way God intended it is you are special, you are important, you are valuable, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. And who you are should cause you to do what you do. But we get that all backwards, we get it all mixed up. And often we live in a world where we're trying to please others so that in truth they might love us. But the true healing for our hearts is when we allow God's love to change us from the inside out. Because the more secure you become in the love of God, the less you look for others to try to do something for you that they can't possibly fulfill in you. No one else can love you like God. And there's no sense of security. There's no sense of self-worth that comes outside or apart from the God who created you and has displayed his love for you. And it's only when you learn to love God completely that you can love yourself correctly. You see, you people beat themselves up because they're not like so-and-so. They don't look like so-and-so. They don't act like so-and-so. They don't have gifts like so-and-so or whatever the other situation. That's all a lie. God Almighty created you. You are special. You are unique. You are precious. And until you believe that, you will not cause the healing that desperately needs to transpire in your soul to take place. But the stronger your love for God grows, the more you can love yourself correctly, and then you can love others sacrificially. You see, loving others comes out of that pure sense of knowing and understanding God. Okay? No, I'm not there yet, guys. Don't go there. Sorry. It starts, our willingness to love others is because we first love God. Jesus said, if you love me, how do you, dis how do you express how do you display that love for other people? By our willingness to trust 
God. Because how do you express love for God? By how you treat the people around you. You cannot separate the two. You cannot say, I love God, and hold awe against your brother and sister. You cannot say, I love God, and be willing to isolate and separate yourself from the people that God created in his own image. See, we love God, and because of our love for God, we love others as the expression of our love for God. Because when our love for God is secure, if you're taking notes, love for God inspires love for others. Look what John wrote. John wrote in 1 John 4, he says this, Dear friends, let us love one another. He's reminding us about the one command that Jesus gave us. Okay? This is the distinguishing mark to his followers. He said, love one another. For why? Love comes from God. See, God never asks you to do something that he doesn't empower you to be able to accomplish. God is a good God. He doesn't, he doesn't ask you to forgive someone else if he hadn't first forgiven you freely. See, God asks you to do things in response to what he's done for you. The more secure you are in God's love, the more you can love others because when you love someone else, you'll stop looking for them to respond in like kind and then have a good day or a bad day depending on how they respond. See, maturity is the ability to love despite what anybody else does in return. See, the more mature you become in your love walk with God, you can love others as Christ loved us. Because Jesus expresses love for us, and many times we're not kind in return, and it doesn't stop him from loving us. It doesn't keep him from hounding us to do, see the best things come to pass in our lives. Even when we're going in the wrong direction, God doesn't kick you to the curb. God doesn't abandon you. God sends us laborers. God provides opportunities to return. God doesn't ask for payment. The payment's already been made. The truth of the matter is, when you learn to accept and understand the love of God, it heals you. It changes you from the inside out. And it gives you the ability to love others as God loves. Because your love for them is not your expression of your love to them. It's your expression of your love to God. And your ability to love them comes from the love that God's put inside of you. The love that God has created in you. Because he goes on to say this. Everyone who loves has been born of God, if you're born again, if you have followed Christ, the love of God is in you. That's who you were created to be. If you are a child of God, then you are a child of love. And the way you express the reality of being a child of God is the way you love. Everyone who loves has been born of God. Go back. I'm not finished. Sorry. Everyone is born of God and what? And knows God. How do you know that you know God? The way you love now, go on to verse 8. Whoever does not love, oh, ouch. This is why you need to be a Bible reader. Because the Bible tells you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear sometimes. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is what? Love. God is love. It's not God has love. God is love. Every time you love it expresses that that's your DNA. That's who you were created to be. If you are in truth a child of God, if you are in truth a follower of Jesus, it's displayed in your way that you love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9. And this is how God showed his love among us. How? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. In other words, Jesus gave of himself to benefit you and I. Love, as Jesus loved, love looks to benefit the lives of others. It's not about what they can get, it's about what they can give. Love is expressed in the ability to be generous, the ability to be gracious, the ability to be kind, even when people are not kind in return. That's what it means to grow up to be like Jesus. How you treat others, how you respond to others, how you love others. That's how God showed his love for us, that we might live through him. Verse 10. And this is love. What is love? 
Not that we loved God. See, we didn't start this. God, it says, but that he loved us. God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our, what? For our sins. In other words, God's love wasn't hindered because we sinned. Love God, God's love was extended because we sinned. Why is it we want to withdraw? Why is it that we don't want to be around people if they've hurt us? If we act that way, we're not allowing Christ to be developed in us. Because it's expressed in our willingness not to be right, but to make a situation right. Sometimes it requires laying down yourself. Sometimes it means going out of your way to extend yourself. That's what it means to be like Christ. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, notice what he says, we also ought. The word ought brings about the idea that it's always a choice. But ought also brings a moral implication. This is something we ought to do. We ought to love one another. So if you're taking notes, we listen. Love, community is where we grow in love. Love's formed. Love grows. Love matures in community. You see, if this is the only person you love, then you are not growing in your relationship with Christ. You see, it requires us to become a part of the community that we can grow in. Because look at what it says, Ephesians 4, I love this. He said, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. In other words, what he's saying here is this. That there is a point we need to come to in life where we allow other people the opportunity to speak into our lives. But here's a big part where we miss it in Christianity. You have to have the relational capital. God didn't create any one of you, and he hasn't given you the responsibility to go around and correct everybody. The responsibility that we have is that when we love people, and you know it as well as I do, because here's four things that I know about everybody in this room. Everybody in this room, the way we interact with people, especially when we don't need people, we all project an image, okay? And what is that image? It's who we desire to be, and it's who we project ourselves to be, but we also know something that we don't always live up to the image that we project. Right? Which means that all of us wear a mask. What's a mask? It's what I know and you don't. Because when sin entered the Garden of Eden, you know what mankind became masters at? Hiding. Adam was scared and he hid. And we often hide behind the images that we project because we, I mean, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's on a college campus, whether it's in a high school, you name it. People trend to try to morph into something that makes us acceptable, that makes us lovable, that makes us somebody that other people want to hang around because we're scared that if we were ever really open, if we were ever really ourselves, maybe, just maybe, someone wouldn't love us. Someone wouldn't accept us. Someone wouldn't want to be with us. So we desire and long to be in a place that we can take off our mask, but we're not even sure that that's possible. We're not even sure that there's an opportunity. See, the, the beauty of what the Christian community should provide, if we are all truly sinners, saved by God's grace, then we should be able to come together knowing that you have baggage, I have baggage. We can help one another be better. And maybe, just maybe, get to that place where we're comfortable enough to take off our mask and let someone else help me with the stuff that we've been scared and trying to do on our own. We are there to make one another better. We're there to strengthen one another, encourage one another, cheer one another on. That's the community God intended us to be because here's something else I know about all of us. All of us have in our lives blind spots. What's a blind spot? It's what everybody else knows and I'm clueless to. But you know as well as I do that it's only when somebody that you know and you have no doubt in your mind loves you, cares for you, is willing to risk and say something to you. Not something you want to hear, 
but something you need to hear. It's in those moments that you have the opportunity to grow. But often what happens is that when people try to go there without having the relational capital, you know that we tend to get hurt and pull back instead of receiving and listening. Because Jesus was full of grace and truth. And it's only truth when you embrace it that can change you. But it has to come. You see, my best friend, been my best friend for years, but I knew and no doubt knew he loved me years ago. I mean, I'm not who I was, and I still got a long way to go in development. But years ago, here's something that's dangerous in the Christian community. The Bible says the Bible can be a sword of the Spirit. That's intended to be used against the enemy, not one another. Not against people, but against principalities and powers. But we have messed up. We have hurt one another with the Scripture. Okay? And we, we, we're, we're going to tell everybody what's wrong with them instead of looking in the mirror and letting that blade shave you. Okay? So in essence... One day I was talking to my friend, and, and I was one, I knew the Bible, but unfortunately in a way that I used to use it, okay, wasn't right. And Steve said to me one day, he goes, dude, what you're saying is right, but you're wrong. Do your whole attitude, your whole way, he goes, you need to learn compassion. It was like he kicked me below the, below the belt. I was like, oh, I, it was so true, but so what I didn't want to hear, but what I desperately needed to hear. I said, God, change me. Help me be who you created me to be. See, you have to have people in your life. And that's the hope is that in a place where we come to, we build some life-giving relationships. Not the superficiality of coming to church. How are you, brother? Great. Okay? When everything is falling apart in your life. We're too afraid to just be real. Because we feel who's, wants, who loves me if I'm real. But that's the truth is the vulnerability makes relationships are built on vulnerability, not strength. Whether you realize it or not, the people you're closest to in life is the people that you've been willing to be open about your own faults and failures and loved you despite them. Those are the people you feel the most comfortable, the strongest relational bonds with is because you know that they love you even for who you are, not who you pretend to be. We grow together in community. Because he goes on to say, the second part of that verse in Ephesians, he says, speaking the truth in love, we grow. And then he says, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It's impossible to grow in love apart from one another. We desperately need one another. We desperately need to help one another to grow, to mature, to be everything that God had. Is that easy? No. Is it risky? Yes. But we will never truly be the people God called us to be. Why is discipleship so scary to the devil? Because the fear is this. If you ever truly embrace the reality of becoming like Christ. If you ever allow the love of God to so dominate the way you act, the way you believe, the way you interact with people, then lives can be changed. Marriages can be changed. Families can be changed. Workplaces can be changed. Communities can be changed. Nations can be changed. When followers are willing to follow, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it asks me to do things that I'm not really championing, but I know I need to do, not that I want to do. It's when I'm willing to grow, when I'm willing to be a part of what God's called me to be a part of. See, the body of Christ means that we desperately need one another. You can't become everything God created you to be apart from the from the fact of community. You can't do it on your own. It's not a biblical concept. I know we've tried our best here in America to try to make it work. But even this, we see, you know, people, I've watched the spiritual Lone Rangers. Even that's a misnomer. You know, the Lone Ranger had Tonto. He didn't even do life alone. You know, the fact is this. We need one another. When God created the world in the beauty of creation, there's only one thing he said wasn't good. That we would be alone. You weren't created 
to go through life alone. We need one another. And if we're serious about taking our next step with God, if we're serious about being the community of people that God called us to be, we have to do it interconnected. We have to do it helping one another to be everything we're called to be. We have to grow in love to be like Christ. That's the end. So my question to you is this. Are you connected regularly in a community of celebration? Do you attend regularly to celebrate the things that God's doing? To be a part of this community? Are you involved in a group? If not, why? Are you scared? Are you fearful? Are you afraid? That's the enemy. God Almighty wants you to be everything. We need one another. Are you involved in a community of activation? Are you actually doing something with your faith? Not just talking it. Is it walking? Are you serving others the way Christ served you? At Vertical Church, we want to lead you to take your next step. To become this year more like Jesus than you've ever been before. That maybe, just maybe, we would become the community that's known by our love.